Well, thank you very much for joining everybody. Uh, today we're looking at the Altmetric service from Digital Science with a specific view to understanding how it can be used and how it is used and employed uh, within funder and government uh, sort of areas. Um, these sort of large institutions that sometimes are a government and a funder. Very often funders uh, are also uh, government institutions themselves, or they may have a particular interest uh, in uh, the angle uh, of, uh, or the prism of uh, funding and funder status when it comes to research outputs. Um, I have divided this into a few different sections. Um, and the, uh, the first one I've called the invisible audience. Um, it's not uh, always obvious how much attention there is to research by the general public um, on the many different uh, places online where these are discussed. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of the technical limitations that people have found when they try to do this manually or they do it through traditional keyword searching. Uh, so to just underline how our service works, what we capture uh, and then what can be done with it. Uh, and once we've understood how we're capturing public opinion and um, uh, reuse of research outside of just purely and strictly scholarly means, um, I'll then explain how our service can actually segment down to extremely detailed levels a particular kinds of attention, particular areas in the world where the attention's coming from, uh, and even filtering down to different specific types of publication and the attention that they've received and how that might be used. Um, then I'll have a look um, briefly at how one can have a look at how a funder's uh, research, the research that's been funded by a specific organization can be pulled into view and can be evaluated, can be benchmarked, um, how it can be explored compared to other similar funders or uh, anything like that and sort of uh, reported on. And then finally, we'll have a look at, as one of my favorite topics over the last few years has been the role of open access and the impact it has in levels of public attention to research. It is it is as yet a, a not completely answered question, but it is a pretty interesting um, a way of filtering our data to have a look at whether it affects or not uh, the level of attention, the coverage uh, of research online. So to come to the invisible audience then, um, when people share or discuss research online, um, they don't tend to conform to academic standards. It would be lovely if they did. Uh, it would mean that it would be a lot easier uh, to understand how the general public, how non-scholars, how people who are key opinion leaders perhaps, but not themselves publishing research, um, are actually interacting with discovering, sharing, and discussing uh, research. So they don't tend to use keywords. That's the first thing. Um, when they share items, they are really linking to them. And they may some say something as simple as, this is interesting research. Um, and so therefore, we actually, if we were to just start Googling uh, terms or filtering social media platforms by what we think they might be talking about, uh, climate change or, or um, particular forms of protest, which are two examples I'm gonna look at briefly, you would not find uh, the attention to research because it's not the keywords that track with the way that that research is shared. They, of course, uh, and that includes me, do not use traditional citation formats. When I'm sharing something on social media, I'm not gonna be making sure that the ISBN is correctly formatted uh, or listing the publication title completely. A tweet sometimes can't in uh, incorporate or accommodate a full publication title. It's already longer than the 240 characters sometimes. Um, and I suppose most importantly, uh, attention to research doesn't happen on a dedicated platform. And there are platforms, of course, dedicated to academic um, research. There's ResearchGate, um, there is academia.edu, there's to some extent Google Scholar. Uh, LinkedIn has, has proven a place where people sort of um, have curated their profile when it comes to them being a researcher, but that's not where the general public tends to talk about it. And even if they do talk on one of those platforms about it, so uh, let's say a, a member of the public actually creates a research gate profile and begins to follow authors, um, or they take a particular interest in a subscription to faculty of a thousand or something like that, ultimately um, it, they behave like the internet does. Uh, it is a distributed uh, different uh, kind of platform where each uh, expression, whether it's a tweet or a blog post or a Wikipedia entry, are all differently formatted and it's going to always be that way. Um, so it is a distributed sort of area. So just to look first at how people actually share items. Uh, these two screenshots come from an item that's talking about um, how CO2 is essentially the, 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 the main uh, thermostat button 
of uh, climate change. And you can see on the left, sort of the larger of the two, uh, of the two screenshots, uh, you can see there that uh, people are using lots of different words, sometimes then actually not sharing words at all. They're, they're linking to something and tagging what appears to be an enormous amount of uh, people. This is an existing conversation on Twitter. When you reply to it, you're automatically replying sometimes to hundreds of people at the same time. Uh, if you were to eyeball this, um, and you were to try and work out what it's about, it's actually impossible to do so because even if you see the link, the link is t.co forward slash and then an alphanumeric hash, which of course is Twitter's shortening service for longer links, which means we can't even identify actually what the system uh, is actually pointing to. Uh, the publication in question, if you were to follow that item, is in, in fact this item, atmospheric CO2, a principal control knob governing Earth temperature. I said thermostat, it's close. They're using the same analogy. Um, so uh, when uh, I speak to uh, institutions who are interested in tracking their social research, they are always surprised by the level of attention that any of their research is getting, because up until now, they've never really had the opportunity of um, accessing a service that knows that there are at least 8,000 different types of short linking service and that to follow each one of them for every uh, possible publication and then find out whether there actually is attention for it is an extremely difficult thing to do on your own. It's, in this uh, sense, this is an invisible audience because it is technically limited uh, in terms of its um, visibility to um, research organizations, governments and funders. So th this is an untapped and very difficult to monitor um, level of interaction online when it comes to uh, research itself. It's important to track it, of course, because um, education about um, research topics and particularly research itself is becoming increasingly important. Uh, just today, there are climate change marches all around the world. Uh, people are heavily sharing uh, the research uh, about climate change. That is why my previous one actually was about climate change. It's one that has appeared in the database and has been talked about very, very recently. In the last uh, day, uh, it's been receiving attention. So it's important to understand what this audience thinks, says, the words they use, uh, the opinions they raise, uh, and which articles they're sharing. The second example is uh, uh, blogs. I'm not going to go through all of the examples we have because we do track something like 14 different types of platform from video content through to Wikipedia and so forth. But this is another example of where, um, again, keywords don't get you to the right uh, place. So this is a blog on, remarkably, political violence at a glance. And their recent post, um, yeah, post from just two days ago, how opposition tactics impact foreign public opinion. This is broadly to do with the um, protests and uh, riots that are occurring in Hong Kong at the moment. And the way that this uh, blog entry cites a particular item, as you can see, is through that old tradition of writing a sentence and then using part of that sentence to link to what is actually uh, an uh, APSR um, article, uh, sorry, APSA uh, article in the American Political Science Review from uh, Cambridge University Press. Um, so again, there it's very, very tricky to discover those links. This is something that Allmetric does by deliberately following tens of thousands of blog accounts and burning through and looking for those links and resolving those links, even if they go through short linking, even if they go through just the DOI link, there's a DOI link here, as you can see, doi.org forward slash and so forth, um, or if they're actually linking to cambridgecore.com or whatever uh, Cambridge's own website is, uh, Oldmetric is trained to, to, to find and, and pick out those uh, bits of attention. And as I promised you, the attention is large and it is globally distributed. Um, this, this all doesn't happen on one or even a few dedicated sites. People, in a sense, misuse social media in order to share a research. By misuse, I, I simply mean that they use it for something other than what it was originally intended for. Um, with Twitter, that was very narrowly an online messaging system that has become uh, quite a compelling, uh, probably the most compelling platform for research. So you can see we have something like 80 million tweets that link to research directly, 5 million news stories, uh, 1.7 million blog entries from, I think it's about 15,000 blogs, 106 million interactions overall. It is a huge data set. And it does go back a long way. Um, in this screenshot, I've, I've snipped it at about 2000, but it goes back, uh, it'll sound unrealistic, but it goes back to the 1930s because there are extremely old policy documents uh, authored by these large NGOs that um, refer to research within their footnotes. 
And some of those policy documents are indeed as old as almost 100 years, something like 80 years. And where they have referred to research that has later been given something like a digital object identifier in retrospect, so to speak, through the digitization process of certain publishers, we are now able to scan those documents, find the citation, uh, in, this, in the case of news and policy, we do this, and we then pull out likely author names, we pull out a date, we pull out what looks like a title, uh, we, f we detect journal names, and if we can resolve that to a modern online record for an item that's been published, uh, even if it was published 80 years ago, um, then we can connect those two. So there is a long tail of data, but as you can see, the, the most relevant and the largest set of it comes from 2012 onwards, when social media started really getting involved with um, uh, distribution of research data. So it is a big audience. So we can show current and past attention to research across the world. Um, we do um, always link to the events themselves. We will never give you just numbers. So it won't say uh, users from Indonesia, uh, 50 or something like that. We will always link to the news item, to the YouTube video or whatever it was that has in its description field somewhere a link to research. Um, it is there so that you can visit the moment when it happened. Um, and where it is available, we also uh, compile some demographics about that information too. Um, I'll sort of show um, how that uh, works um, uh, in a second when we jump into the uh, platform itself. Um, so in the Explorer, which is the sort of the database where all of this attention gets aggregated, uh, we have four large panes that will show you for any search that you have done, whether it's you've done a keyword search for CRISPR gene technology and you want to see what publications there are that respond to that keyword and then to see the attention surrounding it. Uh, or if you just want to look at all the attention in the world without a filter and see everything at once, which is what we're looking at here, uh, you can see immediately in a clickable map, a map where you're allowed to click on the USA or in France or whatever, and then receive the news stories from, sorry, the publication attention from that country to uh, news uh, that have, have been in either news stories uh, or Facebook posts from pages that are registered as being in those countries or tweets where the profile uh, indicates that somebody is from um, Australia or somewhere like that. Uh, so you can begin to segment down and understand where the attention, where the coverage is actually coming from. Uh, you can filter this even more granularly than just by country. So you could say, for example, I would like to look at attention to um, the following 20 publications. I have 20 identifiers that I'm going to search in the system, or I have searched a keyword and I have 20 results or 100 results. And I want to actually have a look at whether these publications have been referred to by a particular Twitter account uh, or a particular news source, the BBC, the New York Times, Zootdodger Zeitung, whatever it is. Um, or you can say, uh, I would like to look at all policy attention uh, to um, these particular items uh, or this particular time period. Um, or you can say, I just want to have a look at the following NGOs. I want the World Health Organization. I want Brookings Institute. I want um, Australian Policy Online, which I think has actually been renamed now to Analysis and Policy Observatory. So they've maintained the APO, the Australians, but they've renamed themselves. We can divide this down by country. We could select three or four different countries uh, and filter all the attention down to there or by date. And this is rather important, I think, for um, uh, government use because you can begin to build and maintain online a list of different kinds of audience, uh, different country attention, um, different attention over uh, a particular time period, uh, or particular key opinion leaders, people who are followed heavily by lots of other people who regularly share uh, research, uh, people who you might want to partner with for distributing information, or who might be useful for a um, um, a panel uh, or some public event uh, when it comes to uh, discussing uh, things like that. I'll show you um, how it works at this point because um, it is all very well, of course, me uh, talking away, but it's worth having a look at it. So we have the Explorer here. This is an unfiltered Explorer. So we have all, as of today, 110.8 million mentions overall. Um, I can search this in lots of different ways. There is a, a basic search over here that allows me to do what I was describing before. Um, I can not type when I'm talking. So I could, for example, say of the items that have received some kind of attention, 
I would like to search all of um, everything that Altmetric has detected as being something that has been shared online by the word CRISPR. It needs to be in the title, it might be in the abstract, um, and then I can get my results back. There are 230,000 mentions of items that have the word CRISPR either in the title, as we can see here, these are the top outputs. Uh, he, here are the top um, Twitter um, accounts that are discussing uh, these CRISPR-related technology publications. Uh, so I can immediately see uh, some people uh, that we might consider to be heavy hitters. Um, very often they can be um, automated accounts. I don't want to say bots because it's a little bit more uh, positive than that. These are sometimes science accounts that are set up to automatically reshare items that conform to a certain search term, or they are um, broadly designed to just be a, a sort of a, a an automatic sharing feature of a repository sometimes. You can see this one, CRISPR papers most likely is what I've just described. We can see immediately where they were published, who they were published by. Um, Altmetric has done a lot of work to affiliate uh, the research um, uh, to its um, uh, original institution where the publication came from. We did that with help from the Dimension Service, which also belongs to digital science. Um, and then we have even broken it down by fields of research as well, subject areas. So we can see when we search for items that are getting online attention, CRISPR research tends to fall into, very predictably, the biological sciences, genetics, and biochemistry and cell biology. There are, of course, uh, more of those, um, and I could go and dig into that detail if I wanted to. Uh, if I went and have a look at the demographics, which is what I've sort of been looking at here, um, then it'll build me a list uh, fairly quickly, I would say, given the amount of uh, tweets and Facebook stories and uh, news stories that are being aggregated here. Uh, we can see immediately the attention online to CRISPR research uh, by country. And I can simply switch over to the news uh, to see the news stories and the news outlets that uh, herald from the United States or from the UK or France or Spain and so forth. Um, and so I could, for example, click on those and I would then get to uh, this mentions tab, which is where I was describing the segmentation that can be done. So if I, as um, someone working uh, in the government, I'm perhaps working on CRISPR technologies myself, if I'm interested in what the audience for CRISPR technology publications is without them even using the word CRISPR, so they perhaps are sharing this stuff without ever talking about it itself, they may be talking around it, or they may have, have linked it uh, in reference to something else, and uh, they're not necessarily describing it in a way that keyword searching would allow, this is the place where I could say, Okay, good. So we've got 366 um, uh, mentions of 309 posts of uh, these data. Um, I'm not terribly interested actually in Germany. I could remove that again. Uh, and I'm actually, I find that all news stories is too broad. I could then say to myself, well, I would like to know, uh, no matter where the source is, uh, the attention to this subject from the Netherlands and from Spain and from, we will include the United States, uh, and United Kingdom perhaps as well. So um, I can sort of segment this down and I may also not want to see absolutely everything. CRISPR technology has been around roughly since 2012 is when it started getting a lot of funding. It is older than that, but that's sort of when it crept into consciousness, when it started showing up uh, on um, podcasts and things like that. So let's go back to let's say 2016. And I could say uh, April the 1st, why not? That was a good April the 1st, uh, all the way through to today. I've got the last sort of three-ish years uh, a little bit more than three years. Now I can then apply that as a filter. This is now my curated audience. I've either decided particular accounts uh, or particular countries in this case, particular dates, and I have then got my 69,000 mentions. A lot of them are undoubtedly going to be uh, on uh, Twitter because uh, Twitter is just so common, but there are news stories in here. This reverse uh, timeline will go back uh, in into, um, into the uh, uh, into the past from the present, and I could save this. I can save this as a search, and I'm now, uh, in a sense, watching these four countries for attention to particular research that I might be interested in. And I can make it a reportable situation. So if I go over to my saved searches over here, you can see I've been working at Altmetric far too long because I've got way too many of these old <laughs> um, searches. But here is my CRISPR search right at the top where I want it to, to be. I can rename it uh, CRISPR audience. I can't spell. There we go. Audience 2019. I could put NL and USA, etc. And simply save that. 
Now, if that were of particular interest to me, and I'm actually going to need to be watching this audience every day, I want to know what the distribution is going to be like as time goes on. I could set that to my default view so that the next time I log into the Explorer, instead of seeing uh, just the sort of vanilla uh, results of everything that was available like we began with, I would actually begin with this view. I would begin with it having filtered down to what I'd asked it uh, to be my sort of standard if I select that button. I'm not going to do it now because it reloads the page. Um, but I can also say, well, I would actually like a email. I would like an email on a daily basis with new attention for the criteria that I have put in. I, I would like uh, this particular audience that I've curated or this particular keyword in this time frame. I would just like to know all new attention to research uh, that Allmetric has found. Or I can have it weekly or monthly or all three or a combination. I'm going to deselect these because uh, I keep doing this. I, I keep demoing this feature and then I forget to deselect it and then I get 1,008 new emails uh, every day. If I want that email right away, I can click on that, and then when I go and open my uh, email inbox, it will already be there. It takes less than two seconds for it to appear. Um, and it'll be named what I have just named it. All of that is, is created immediately. If I wanted a more formal report on exactly the same kind of audience, so I want to, I want to be able to pass this on to my department head, or I need it for some sort of internal briefing, um, I can uh, create a report based on that straight away. Now, don't worry, it won't be always called the thing that I just typed because very often our internal saved names for things aren't exactly as elegant as we would like them to appear in reports. So I can then edit that report and I can rename it. Um, so I can say, yes, well, I'm going to call it something a bit more fancy than that. CRISPR Research Attention 2019 brackets three years, something like that. Um, there we go, and that has simply saved it. I can uh, either leave these sections in, this sort of summarizes the number of uh, attention, where, you know, if it's divided out by source or how many individual uh, outputs are being talked about here, uh, how many outputs actually have attention. So we know about four and a half thousand, actually 4,300 get some attention, the rest have maybe only citations or Mendeley readers. So they exist in our database, but they have yet to actually be mentioned online. So it's only a small amount actually, which means the level of engagement with CRISPR research is extremely high. Um, for other sources, it may be extremely low. There, it may be that there is a lot more um, in terms of items that exist uh, within our database but have not yet been mentioned. Um, I could have an attention breakdown. And then you could also have some of these uh, graphs that show attention over time. And we can decide what kind of attention that is. So whether it's uh, only news stories, please. I would like to have uh, the news attention uh, over time. Or I would like to say news stories but only over the previous calendar year. Um, so we can then see uh, the attention there as well. Um, and then we can see the top outputs. I could remove that if I didn't like that. I could add a different attention chart and say, well, actually, I would like to see where patents have referred to research in CRISPR. So you can see there, 2012, that's where we had a bit of an interesting year. Like I say, that's sort of roughly when the innovation really began. Like I say, it is also much older. So uh, 2010, there were some patents, but it really is in these last few years that inventions have really started to refer to publications. So Altmetric also picks that up. Uh, we will notice when innovations occur based on the fact that that patent has in its full text somewhere a reference to this publication that has the word CRISPR in the title um, or um, those kinds of things. So you can sort of track innovations that way too. And if I wanted to, I could then make that public. That just purely means that it's going to create a link up here that is shareable. It does not mean it is a Googleable thing. Um, I can share this report uh, with you, in fact, if I drop this into the chat here, uh, you will see that you can actually visit that too and you will come to this page. You could decide to print it. Uh, it is much more compelling when you do not. Uh, not only does it save paper, but these nice mouse overs where you see the numbers of news mentions and so forth, they are maintained online. And if you chose, here we decided a particular time frame. But if you chose, for example, as your time frame back in the Explorer where we were um, searching for, um, let's go back, here we go. Um, if I just simply left this blank, uh, it would show me essentially all the attention up to uh, midnight last night, because this Explorer, our data set gets refreshed at midnight every night. Those reports, if they are based on a timeline that includes to the present moment, will carry on being accurate a week from now, a month from now. If you were to come back and visit 
a report that has not been limited like I'd limited it and uh, it is there simply to show everything in the previous year or the current year uh, if it's in the current year it'll be up to the moment before you had a look at uh, the item again so those graphs remain up to date up to the uh, prior midnight like I say um, so it is quite compelling to have those online it means you can do some meaningful metrics around particular audiences particular fields of research particular groups of publications perhaps you're interested in the publications that your uh, government organization has had a hand in funding and I'm about to come to that bit too um, or have actually written directly it can sometimes be the case that uh, government agencies have published themselves a fair decent whack of publications you can then follow the attention to those publications over time as well or more interestingly perhaps you can follow the attention to publications of other government agencies or other um, funders or, or uh, more generally outside of the funding area or government area across the world um, since our service actually does have the ability for you to search by affiliation or by funder so um, I've strayed a little bit, but I have a feeling I accidentally uh, covered where I was going up next. Let's see, I've talked about uh, that. You could follow uh, attention to a field of research in the same way that I just did as well. I'll just very quickly show how that's done. Um, you can do it in the quick uh, sort of search. If you typed in, for example, genetics, it will search for the keyword, it'll search for, it's gotta be in the title, whether it's the publisher name, and there is our subject area. So if I'm interested in genetics generally, um, the subject area, by the way, comes from the Australia and New Zealand Standard for Research Classification, the ANZSRC, a rather long acronym, but it, their uh, categories are called the standard uh, field of research categories. They are not controlled by us. They are pre-existing and go all the way from the hard sciences through to the humanities. So another pretty useful way of dividing out really any research into any given topic from human geography all the way through to art, music, literature, and so forth. Um, or I could say, like I was promising to show, um, that I could go and select a different funder name. So just for fun, I believe uh, National Natural... Uh, National Natural Science Foundation of China. Perhaps I'm interested in seeing what has that uh, funder uh, searched or what have they published? So what have they funded? What have they published? So I could go and have a look at them in terms of their uh, publications. They don't appear all that often as an author or at least as an author affiliation. Uh, there are 173 mentions of just a few items. Their role of course uh, is more in the uh, case of being a funder. And so uh, we will move on to that in a minute. Um, I've shown all this as well, so I'm allowed to move on to sort of where I was. <laughs> so uh, before I run the report on um, what uh, the uh, National Natural Sciences Foundation of China or um, quite Fund of China has done, uh, it's worth pointing out why it might be important to have a look at uh, the impact that a funder's research has had. So we are about to look for uh, what this uh, Chinese funder has funded. This is something that we also get internally at Digital Science from our um, sub-team at Uber Research. They've been working with funders for a long time. And so we have mined uh, funder data to find out the publications that they have funded. Um, the public websites sometimes of uh, funders also allow us to do that. Uh, in the case of a government funder, uh, the European Union's various um, vessels for funding, the ERC, uh, the European Commission, the European uh, Research Council and the, the EU more generally have uh, are all funders and have all got websites that allow you to uh, see these things. Um, we have aggregated all of those together and then we have also mined publication data all around the world in order to find in the acknowledgement sections where this funder is also thanked. So there's three different methods by which we have done this. So we can understand uh, when uh, something is funded by a particular funder or a particular government, uh, what are the items that get really incredible traction? Uh, what are the most engaged with items? What audiences are reached with that? Um, I'm about to do the search for the uh, the Chinese funder. We will then see an adapted view of everything we've just looked at, whether it's uh, the timeline of attention, whether it's just a list of all the publications in order of um, either the highest or lowest attention or the highest number of policy um, uh, mentions. Um, we can even see it, as I'll show, broken down by where it's been published and then uh, obviously what publications are policymakers reading because you can order the attention that a funders funded research has received by where it was uh, published and then the amount of times in that uh, publication 
uh, in which uh, there are also mentions of these items within policy. And as I was already hinting, it is, I think, pretty interesting also to see what kind of patents are uh, interacting with uh, research funded by a particular funder. So when it comes to something like uh, the National Science Fund, the NSF in the, in the U US, uh, or the Wellcome Trust in the UK, it is pretty interesting to be able to have a look at, uh, let me just correct my spelling mistake there. Um, it is pretty interesting to look at the level of attention that patents have to that research. Does this funder engender inventions or not? And if that level seems high or low, how does it compare to another uh, funder? We can go and search for that funder and order by that patent literature or save that as a search and get new alerts when patents are discovered that have referred to the publications of this particular government body or this particular funder. So that is why it sort of is uh, uh, valuable. I did take a screenshot of the National Natural Science Foundation of China. So these are the 413,000 outputs that have been funded uh, by the NNSFC, I believe, uh, over time. It is an enormous amount. Like I say, it dwarfs where they are considered to be an author or an affiliation. The, their role here is really as having been a funder of it, even if it was published by somebody in uh, Beijing University or University of Cambridge or somewhere else, because they do fund research around the world, we will find where this publication actually was funded by them. And we can see trends over time. They had a couple of years that were real killers and the general trend is upwards um, uh, very significantly with a little bit of a drop in uh, between uh, July of 18 and January of 19, but still on the up. And we're of course only halfway, three quarters of the way actually through 2019. So if I were to redo that search live, I'm gonna close this. Um, I can go and pop over here. I can edit my search. I'm actually now going to use, instead of the quick search, I'm going to now use the uh, more advanced search. It does exactly the same thing. It just allows you to know what um, uh, box you're going to be putting your search into rather than just typing a word. And then our box guesses all the different versions of your query, whether you're looking for a funder or an affiliation uh, or uh, you're looking in a particular journal. Here, I can simply say, um, I'm going to drop over to funder name. Uh, I'm going to type in national natural sciences there it is and i'm looking in the full database my version of altmetric here is just searching everything there are some customers who have a, their own version of altmetric where they see their own internal publications first uh, but i'm using a completely blank one here so here we are with the 1.2 million mentions of the uh, several hundred thousand um, uh, outputs and i can see immediately the items that have been talked about just sheer numbers uh, how many uh, uh, which publications have been spoken about very regularly they have thousands of tweets they have maybe hundreds of news stories they've appeared in high value uh, outputs or i could order it and say well actually i just want to have a look at where uh, the national natural science foundation of china has um, funded articles that have then uh, been very dominant in the patent space, even if they've not really been mentioned anywhere else. And as you can see from the search result, that is very often the case. Uh, the orange you're seeing there means that it is a patent source that is talking about it. Uh, the numbers are always low for patents because we score them in a different way than we score the noise from social media. Uh, social media noise can reach into the thousands easily because you can have thousands of independent tweets. You can have hundreds and hundreds of news stories. But when it comes to patents, we um, score by uh, patent territory, by um, what's it called, uh, by region. Um, I forget the technical word for it. Um, so it, never mind the fact that these numbers are quite low. A three simply means that it was either the US Patent Office or WIPO or the European Patent Office that has mentioned this. But as you can see, something with a score of three has 80 patents uh, or at least 80 mentions within patents uh, to uh, its publication. So this is an immensely uh, successful patent. Uh, we can, uh, sorry, a publication. It has been mentioned in a lot of different patents uh, and we can see immediately what uh, these patents were. We will link you through to it as well. You will end up at the dimensions page for that patent. You can go and read the full text. You can see a couple of other, all the other references that this patent makes. It cites almost getting on 3000 items. It cites out of publications. One of these uh, or many uh, are the ones that have been funded by uh, the National National Natural Sciences Foundation of China. And we can see various legal events as well. So we can get a good sense of the patterns of innovation that have happened around a particular funder's output. 
Or we could see their demographics. When a particular funder or a particular government or a particular entity of any kind has funded research, does it end up sort of um, uh, broadly distributed? Where are the uh, most key engaging um, social media um, uh, audiences? Which countries are they in? Uh, if we have a look at the posts and pages uh, that we that we track, we only track public pages on, on Facebook, by the way. We don't track individual users. Um, that is a, a technical limitation from Facebook and probably a good one, I would say. Um, it's having a bit of a trouble um, loading that one, never mind. Um, and uh, I could go and have a look at, you know, when news stories uh, cover these uh, data from this particular um, uh, uh, funder or this government, uh, where are those based as well? I'm just going to reload the page. I think I'm, I've had some issues with my, yes, I'm on a, sorry, I'm on a VPN, which I should have not done. Um, so you can then also um, see that kind of attention as well, segmenting that audience in exactly the same way. And we could even go down to uh, particular uh, mentions uh, as we did before. We could say, well, all right, we have the attention from this, um, uh, the publications that have been funded by this particular uh, area. I would now like to either export that tab. I can just download uh, up to a million items at once and uh, play with these data offline. Um, if you have an API license with us, you can actually plug these data into internal visualization systems. Uh, you can build some uh, business intelligence systems based off these data. Uh, it is a, a runtime API, so you can build live applications on them. And I've got a few that I'll show you in just a moment. Um, you could actually create public education portals around the attention uh, that you as a government uh, uh, institute or you as a funder or, or any sort of um, sort of a, a developer of research or curator of research have made. Um, it's a little bit like that, uh, our world in data um, sort of um, effort by Hans Rosling and, and other people where they are visualizing uh, certain data around the world exactly the same thing can be done about a uh, public attention to research uh, and so we have built the ability for that um, to be developed by um, our uh, customers uh, using uh, our API um, or I can follow these uh, items again I can create a search uh, that is saved I can then save that search and give it another name and say it already has given me a rather obvious name for it and I can then begin to curate uh, various saved searches, create reports and alerts around a particular funder, uh, explore what policy are they, are they influencing, uh, what sort of uh, items are there that are sort of uh, tracking in an interesting way. That's actually one point I didn't show. Uh, let's go back to the National Natural uh, Sciences. It's an easy uh, name to remember, just this National Natural, that lovely tongue twister that they've come up with. Um, on the final tab here, what I was trying to describe before is all of the publications funded by this funder, or actually essentially this governmental body, that have appeared in a certain publication, and then we can order them in different ways. So for example, we can say, when this funder funds publications that end up in journals, what journals are the policymakers reading because they are then citing those items in policy documents? policy documents that we have downloaded in the now half a million, I think there are different documents um, and have sort of data mined them and looked for these references. So when um, we are looking at uh, funded by uh, this particular funder, um, when it comes to policy, PLOS One, the PNAS, environmental pollution, nature, chemosphere, if you, uh, and, and science of the total environment and uh, journal of climate. So they are obviously uh, doing a lot of uh, funding for research into clean energy, into air quality, into electric cars, into battery technology, uh, into mitigation of the effects of climate change. Very obviously, if we just look at this list of journals. Here, we now actually have a, a one to n list of what it is that policymakers are reading, which means you have now segmented your policy audience accidentally in a way. Yeah, we can see the countries that they're coming from. So we, we could go and have a look at the demographics and go and click on the policy uh, label. And if it's going to be nice and spare me, it will load uh, the policy map. And it'll, it did. It, it spared me. How wonderful. I just had to ask. That's all I had to do. Um, uh, we can see here where the policymakers are based. But what it is they're reading is quite interesting as well. Uh, and OK, none of these are completely unknown items. And it does, for example, demonstrate the value of preprint servers, uh, archive and things like that are very important. Um, they, they are they are mentioned quite a lot, but uh, if I then have my list of what it is policymakers are reading, 
admittedly fairly famous items, I do then have a publication strategy. Um, I know that this funder impacts policy when they are publishing or when they are funding items that ultimately end up in the following areas. Now, it doesn't always have to be extremely high impact factor journals. That's something that I think people are slowly becoming aware of and getting away from. Um, these will sometimes be journals that are impactful in their um, very careful um, uh, scientific selection and coverage of what it is they're publishing. And this um, use of altmetrics, I think, allows people to get away from metrics that were designed very much for the publishing in the academic community and uh, allow you to discover where journals or publication repositories are punching above their weight in terms of engagement with the general public, with key opinion leaders, and other people who have never heard of a journal impact factor, who don't know what that is and don't really care. Um, and so it can allow you to then see uh, that there are other effective methods of publication that don't just rely on things like the impact factor or on citation numbers or whatever it is that is very useful for academia, very, very handy for publishing, uh, a very good uh, measure of general quality, I suppose, of, a, of a, a journal. But ultimately, when it comes to affecting change, when it comes to um, interfacing with uh, different audiences, this is one of the ways in which you can do that. My goodness, that was a long paragraph. Thank you for sitting with it and through me through that. Um, last point, and then I'll take questions and uh, wrap up so I don't run over. It has been an interesting um, uh, question whether um, publishing things in open access increases uh, or has some other measurable effect upon how it's engaged with. Uh, very often, we have all followed a link from a social media platform to a piece of research only to be confronted by a paywall. Does that mean that um, attention drops for that item or does it mean anything? Uh, does, does, is there an effect uh, to be seen there? We every year do a top 100 uh, items um, sort of list. We've done one, I think, since 2014. They're all archived online. If you just search Altmetric Top 100, you will find it. Last year's um, was the first time that we saw that the spread of closed items versus items that are a combination of free and open access. So they may have been published in a traditional way, um, all rights reserved for the publisher, um, not technically open access. There were no um, open access fees paid, for example. Uh, the retention of rights was the, the, uh, the simple mechanism there. But a combination of that availability being um, uh, aggregated, so the ability that any member of the public can get to this article and read it, that finally achieved a more than 50% distribution of the items that were most spoken about in 2018. Um, it had gradually crept up in the in the previous years. I think it was about 45% the year before, very close, 40 to 45% the year before that. So the segment is certainly growing. Now, we have to be quite careful about those numbers. It could be that it's simply because more people are publishing open access stuff, more, more um, publishers are offering open access journals, um, more researchers are opting uh, for open access, and things like um, the proposed Plan S and, and other mandates uh, within countries that research funded by a certain funder or from a certain body um, or from uh, even institutional levels. Um, some institutions say, we're very sorry, but you, 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 we actually have an open access mandate. We need to uh, have at least a percentage, uh, a specific percentage or uh, as much as possible uh, published open access. All of these can also affect this. It may not simply be that because an item has been published open access, it is more likely to be in the top 100 or something like that. But uh, it does allow you uh, in the system, you can have a little bit of a play with these uh, data. So if we go back to our front page of our Explorer, we do now have the ability for any search, whether I'm gonna look for keywords or a certain category, or I've got a specific title that I want to search, or I can just drop in specific DOIs, like I've said, um, you know, up to 25,000 different identifiers at one time. Um, once I've done that search, there is also the ability to simply say, um, is uh, an item open access or not? It is right here. And for any data that you search in the system, uh, whether we go back to our natural, National Natural Sciences Foundation of China example, if I downloaded a, a portion of their data, even if I hadn't selected the open access versus closed access item, there will be a, a, a field in that CSV spreadsheet that tells you 
um, open access uh, uh, status is true or false. In other words, it either is open or it is not. Um, and so you can then see, um, we could actually try it right now. This is something I've not actually tested with uh, National Natural Sciences Foundation. So if we go and have a, a search of their items again, we've sort of got their, their broad data there. I could then amend it and say, well, all right, how does it look if we just filter to publications that they funded that ended up being open access? What proportion of attention is there? How many items is that? Um, what level of attention do they receive? And again, we get who it is that's sharing this item. So we do drop. Uh, a significant amount. Uh, we're down from 1.2 to 662,000, almost on the nose 50%. Um, but it's much fewer uh, items uh, that we have here now. So uh, we have about 128,000 that have actually been mentioned. And then again, we can begin to explore what have people said in the last three months about items funded by this funder or this government body that uh, have an open access status. In other words, when we opened it up, is there a difference in the audience that we're reaching? What are they saying? Um, I will actually export this in the CSV just so you can see. Uh, there is a brief note there about um, uh, data from Twitter, which um, Twitter is very careful about how it distributes its data these days, of course. Um, so I could then go and download these items. It may be a while because we're downloading 128,000 uh, uh, records and all of their different counts, or I could even go a bit further and get the individual mentions, the individual tweets, the individual blog posts uh, to open items uh, about this. So it's a larger list now, of course, we're, we're talking more than just 128,000 items, we're talking 600,000 mentions of items. So I could then again also export these uh, or save those. I could save that as uh, an alert as well. I want to watch open access items from this particular institution uh, funded by this particular funder and so forth. So let's see, uh, let me try and summarize myself then. Um, I think the, the, the key points that I wanted you to take away is that there is a very large audience out there. Um, you can see it's, it's over 100 million interactions with research that we have found uh, online over time. That is a big audience, an audience that increasingly is demanding, uh, we think, uh, some uh, real um, de uh, debate based on uh, research and uh, the sharing of knowledge. Uh, you, I hope I have shown you um, how easy it is to follow and measure specific audiences, whether it's to a field of research, whether it's to a keyword, whether it's to a time period, whether it's just information on a particular platform, um, and then how you can pull down these data and filter it out by where the funding came from. Um, what is published by people who are funded by a certain funder. What areas are they in? Where do they get the most traction? Is there invention happening? Is there policy attention? When that policy attention exists, what is it that those policymakers have read? What journals are they pulling that attention from? And then finally, um, some uh, for those institutions that are still having to debate whether they should have an open access policy or not, should we as a government institution do open access or not? That argument has been won, I think, in some of the bigger governments around the world. Uh, openness is very much a valuable thing, but if you need some measurable data on how audiences behave or what kind of attention is received when things are open access, uh, our data set does provide a decent amount of information from which to benchmark uh, the claims of the benefit of open access. So with that, I will stop speaking. Um, and uh, I will have a look at some questions. So there is one question for now that is always welcome, of course. I'll always uh, enjoy uh, less work rather than more, but let's have a look. Um, I have had a question here. Um, can we get these outputs for gray literature, um, e.g. with DOIs? Um, so in other words, can gray literature be measured as journal articles can? Um, if gray literature features legitimate digital object identifiers, uh, then we are tracking those by default. So it is very unusual, by the way. Uh, normally, gray literature is just reports in PDF or Word that are dropped online. That is slowly changing. Um, policymakers are realizing that just downloads isn't quite enough anymore for um, measuring attention. But the, the idea that um, policymakers want to understand the uh, attention to their research um, outputs even if they're not published in journals, has grown. That is something that is now uh, highly in demand. The tips I can give for that is that 
whichever uh, source of grey literature you, you mean, whether it's your own or, or, or something like that, it does need to have um, scholarly identifiers attached to it. So a real DOI. There are various ways of getting one of those. Um, ResearchGate mints DOIs. Uh, Figshare, which is a, a data repository and increasingly a, um, rep a general repository for research, also mints them automatically using data site DOIs. Those are all automatically captured by Altmetric when they then show up on social media um, or in the news or, or anywhere in the, in the 14 or 15 sources that we track. Um, so if, if they do not have them, and they are just links online. They're just, I don't know, um, policymaker.org forward slash PDF, right? Those are not captured by us because we don't know to be listening out for them. Uh, there are m a, a multitude of links being shared on uh, just any, give me any social media name like Twitter or, or Facebook. We um, can only work out that something is research when it features a scholarly identifier. But we can do the work prospectively. We can't go retrospective, unfortunately. Uh, with people who have grey literature um, to implement specific tracking uh, for their items if it conforms to a fairly standard web standard called um, canonical URIs. I won't get into it right now because it's a bit complicated, but as long as we can uh, track those links, we can do that. The best bet, however, is definitely to, to mint DOIs for your publications, to place them on the page, to put the right meta tags in um, so that when a link gets shared and we uh, follow it and spot that there is a, a DOI there, um, then we can discover it. I hope that that helped. Another question here, um, can we look at a uh, number of clicks on an article and tell if they are from an .edu user? No, uh, we don't track usage stats at all, actually. Um, uh, downloads and usage stats are a bit of a poison chalice when it comes to impact because um, a, a couple of reasons. One is that um, a lot of downloads are in fact anonymous. Uh, they are not tied to somebody who has an email address in that same profile. Um, a lot of them, or, or certainly the earlier ones, those clicks are in fact indexing machines for social, sorry, for search engines, um, which means that a lot of that is just the indexing process of the web, uh, picking up an item. Sometimes there are bot-based downloads happening. Sometimes there are repeat downloads from a user or a download that didn't result in a read. Um, and then you get into even more murkier waters. For example, if an item was, um, if usage stats on a certain platform, like an aggregator, uh, like a, a research aggregator, are measured, but that aggregator has an embargo in place with the original publisher where they're not allowed to host the most recent two years of that publisher's content because that publisher wants to maintain an audience for its newer and they're hoping much more interesting and impactful uh, and, and sort of um, current uh, data, then you have a split amount of downloads. Uh, and so you're then uh, dividing up uh, these metrics. That's why we focused instead on metrics where we can actually bring you back to where it actually happened. Um, so now I'm not aware of the ability to do that just yet, unfortunately. Um, uh, let me read another one here. Hello, my name is Astadi from Indonesia. Hello, Astadi. Can this alt metric output about research from good quality also reputable international journals valid for literature review and raw material? Um, to understand your question, I think you're asking whether Altmetric can serve as a level of quality for something. It most definitely cannot. Um, I can give you a good reason why, actually. If I just go back to um, the Altmetric service itself, which has now uh, timed out, unfortunately, because it's, well, it actually finished the download and then something, um, maybe I've uh, had some kind of issue on my VPN again, um, but, if I were to search this word, retracted. Yeah, there's an awful lot of retracted items around here. Uh, let's pick one that I know fairly uh, decently. Retracted, uh, a long-term long -term toxicity of a Roundup herbicide and Roundup tolerant genetically modified maize. This was published by, without looking, Giles Eric Serralini, University of Caen in France. This was retracted, it was published, I believe, on Springer to begin with, and then it was retracted after it was pointed out that the rats that he used in the, in the study get cancer anyway after 90 days. And he was there feeding them either pure Roundup in water or corn with Roundup, and published an article claiming that we're all gonna die from uh, some sort of agro mass suicide. 
um, it has an immensely high score. You'll notice it appears in five different policy sources. It has appeared on a peer review site, not a surprise. It has appeared uh, on 11 different video uploaders on YouTube, 50 news stories. Um, I could, if I were uh, Mr. Seralini or somebody else uh, who is keen for attention and demonstrate that I have engaged with a lot of people, I could claim that this is evidence of my excellence. But if you were to look at what the policy documents actually say, um, there are various reviews here. These do not come out favorably. Um, there are various news stories that are extremely obviously talking about um, uh, this very divisive um, sort of area. Um, and uh, there are various other, uh, it's very, very quickly uh, seen in the data that this is not welcome attention. So high scores do not mean good data. They don't mean good publications. They don't even mean um, good um, positive attention. So please don't do that. Um, don't use uh, the data from Altmetric to judge good or bad journals. This simply shows you what was said and how much of it was said. That is um, really what I'm, I think, trying to say. I hope I um, understood your question correctly. Uh, are data sets with a DOI being followed by Altmetric? Yes. If the DOIs are being minted via a DOI organization like Crossrep or DataCite, we automatically capture them. So, for example, right out of the box, we follow everything that's on Figshare. Uh, you will go, if you go to Zenodo, uh, the data repository that sits outside of digital science, you will find that there are also badges for Altmetric data found there. So it doesn't matter what it is. Um, we will track it if it has a scholarly identifier that is recognizable by a machine. Um, now, there are not many references to data sets, actually. Uh, you can filter the service by data sets. Um, so, for example, if I were to go back to uh, this item here uh, and to clear the fields, briefly get rid of everything that I was searching, you'll notice here there is a data sets button. I could go and run that search and it'll bring the I must say, not very high. I mean, there's 155,000 mentions of data sets, but there's there's something like 26,000 and a half uh, data sets themselves. Not a bad result, actually, given that these are just data sets being linked to. They don't come from a journal. They may sit within a journal, and they do. They sit within Dryad uh, or a Chem Archive. Um, they are minting identifiers that are Chem Archive identifiers uh, from DOIs uh, that are uh, about those data sets. It means that the data set itself is being directly linked, which is, of course, a, a much rarer thing than the article itself. But yes, we do uh, track data sets and clinical trials and other things uh, that have those. Blimey, there are a lot of questions. Um, for the metrics around policymakers shown earlier, do they refer to policy output produced by policymakers or uptake by policymakers? The metrics around policymakers shown earlier, do they refer to outputs? These are outputs from policymakers. So we download the, let's say, 100,000 publications, uh, the policy publications that come from, let's say, the World Health Organization, and we then find within it uh, the references to literature. So we will find, let's say, 250 publications that are cited within a policy document. Um, and sort of that is what you're seeing there. You will see, um, if I go back to, let's pick something, if I'm on here at the moment, I think it's very unlikely. Oh, actually, no, let's look at that. Even data sets have policy attention. That's useful. Um, I have learned a new thing. Uh, so if I just pick this item here, um, you will see this data set has been referred to by two different sources and eight different documents. So the APO and who's the other one? The Higher Education Funding Council, HEFKE, the metric tide. Uh, you'll notice also that it's picked up twice. The metric tide was republished uh, over in APO. So you can see the number of sources and you can see the individual items themselves. We will link to it every time. So you're seeing the actual publications in policy uh, of, of what's being talked about. Um, I hope that helps. Uh, what kind of institutions are included in policy documents? Government agencies, think tanks, or both? Uh, it is actually both. Um, we, for example, also have charities. Um, Oxfam, um, oh man, I haven't done this list for a while. Uh, Oxfam, the APO, uh, World Health Organization, Brookings Institute, the UK government, uh, Overheit and Reisoverheit from the Netherlands, and various others. There's about 82 different organizations. We're just adding the Flemish government and the Flemish parliament right now as well. And we have a wish list of over 300. So um, where it is technically possible to index those data and uh, where it is in other words, they are available. They have to be publicly available. We, we can't um, access items that are behind a paywall. And where they actually cite items as well. 
there are amazingly some policy sources out there that do not do any citing. They just sort of present a position uh, and all of the footnotes are missing. We can't accommodate those, of course, because we have to be able to tie it to research. Um, so there's a, there's a big list. Our customers get um, can, can see a, a list of uh, who we index. And we take, um, we take recommendations all the time. Um, so yeah, um, let's see. Uh, uh, how do you, how and if do you track syllabi? Uh, yeah, I didn't cover that at all, actually. We do track the Open Syllabus Project uh, to some extent. Um, this is a smaller data set and it's only visible if I were to go and clear my search and have a look at the front page again. Um, this drop down here allows you to see syllabi. So we will show, uh, and you'll know, you'll see immediately that uh, typically items that are uh, uh, published here are much older. They tend to be books and they tend to be very different. So it's Orientalism by Edward Said, for example, the Odyssey by Homer, uh, elements of style, very, very famous. This is the, the style handbook, I believe. Um, I think it is anyway, yeah. Terrible if it's a, a manual of how to dress, perhaps. I, I wouldn't know. Um, so we do have that as well. And we present that slightly differently. We, we get this as a download from the Open Syllabus Project. So you can see where in the world uh, particular institutes have uh, a syllabus that lists uh, your uh, publication on a particular syllabus. That is an edge case. It doesn't, as you can see, it doesn't tend to uh, refer to articles. Uh, you know, Second Tutors of Government by John Locke, for example. Uh, we've got some T.S. Eliot there. So there is some humanities in there as well, but it is much more minor. It's much smaller. Um, and the data are got directly via download from um, Open Syllabus Project rather than uh, crawling uh, for it. So it's slightly differently implemented, but it is there. Um, uh, can one drill down into Mendeley Info to get a sense of the type of researchers looking at your work? Yes, but with a caveat. That's it. These are these are all new questions for me. This is cool. Um, so our Mendeley um, representation of data is shown in one place, and that is um, if you go and select an item and you end up on what's called the Altmetric Details page. So we're now looking at a particular publication. Um, there is a Mendeley Readership tab right here. That you'll see the Twitter demographics for just this item, and then you will see the Mendeley readers. And brilliantly, I've chosen one where there's no uh, country data, but you can see here there is a demographic breakdown. And if it's not enough, we always link to the associated Mendeley record so you can uh, do that. We can't aggregate them, unfortunately. Um, Mendeley doesn't belong to us, and um, the data isn't available. The data aren't available to us in the same kind of way, so we can't aggregate them in that manner. But you can very easily and very quickly uh, come to uh, an item's uh, attention on Mendeley and we, we do uh, demonstrate that breakdown and where there is a country specified in the Mendeley records uh, so the Mendeley profiles we do show them as well that's a good question I haven't, I haven't looked at um, Mendeley too much actually um, lots of attention is paid to challenged research that's absolutely true uh, and that is uh, in other words to, to go back to um, to whether um, high attention is good or bad, uh, it is a supporting point that attention, uh, so the, the research that is controversial gets a lot of attention. That of course does not mean that that uh, research is legitimate. In fact, it's that limbic part of our brain that is being um, electrified by um, that kind of research. That's why climate research is spoken about so heavily and um, uh, health research is spoken about heavily. But it's quite a different thing um, to engage in research uh, that is going to be on a hot button topic versus uh, publishing research in any area uh, that is then deemed to be through peer review process and post peer review process and through further analysis to be something that may not have been legitimate or may have come to a faulty or an impar a partial conclusion. But the, the thing is that high attention will track both of those. High attention will follow with nutrition research that is valid and it'll, uh, there'll be high attention to nutrition research that is invalid as well. And so that's why you cannot use high attention, big numbers, um, to say this was good research, this was money well spent. You have to spend the time on the data itself so that you can see what is it that's actually being said. This, um, uh, to come back to the Seralini study, there are an immense amount of citations for it as well. But what do those citations say? Are they all in articles that are arguing with it and are presenting 
um, powerful uh, cases against it, or are they supportive? Um, so that is somewhere where I want bibliometrics to go next. Uh, up until now, it's been, as we say in a, in a different part of digital science, it has been a very simplistic process up until very recently. Um, just how many citations did you get? And did you publish in articles, in, in journals that had high impact factors, yes or no? And it almost ends the conversation there. But we're now getting to a place where there is the technical ability to see what was said, to, to see snippets of when you were cited within a journal article, what was actually the, the context for that? And was it supportive? Was it um, a meandering neutral? Uh, reference where it was just a sort of a general reference uh, or was it a negative one and can we then learn something from dividing those data down further yeah it's a very interesting one um, let's see uh, government funders should be very interested in the attention paid to the output of their work but arguably they should pay lots of attention uh, to the negative attention so they are able to respond to the argument I absolutely agree uh, my favorite question which is not a question um, I think that Things like altmetrics and things like monitoring services online should bring to the attention of funders, of governments, of charities, of independent research institutes, of people like the, uh, what are they called? The uh, Genetic Literacy Project, people like that. Um, it is important to understand where science or research or knowledge is being misapplied or misused or misrepresented. Um, I say this when I go and visit academic institutions all the time, especially when they work in climate or health. So these are under attack from uh, online communities. They are being misused. And it is very hard for them to see that without a system like ours or without um, a, a, an ability for monitoring these kinds of areas. It is extremely important for public education. The big one, for example, is, is um, vaccines. Vaccines where there are measurable negative outcomes to the misunderstanding about vaccines. Um, and so any effort that can be made to improve public knowledge is literally saving lives it, very, very quickly, um, very immediately. Um, and so, yes, that is that is an excellent point. And that is a point I'll end on, actually. Um, this These data are not just nice to have and to look at and interesting. These data ultimately mean changes in behavior, changes in longevity, changes, uh, the ability to measure public understanding about any particular area will have measurable outcomes on the world, um, whether it's on something like nature or whether it's on um, uh, the, the human environment or whatever it is. Uh, this, I think, is probably the thing that um, uh, governments and funders and institutions and even individual researchers can benefit from uh, when they use our system. I'm aware you have been extremely kind with your time. Um, I'll pop in the last slide, which has my contact details on it. If I've missed something or if I misinterpreted a question, ben at altmetric.com. You can ping us at altmetric at, at altmetric.com. My goodness, you have to say it twice. Um, thank you very much for your time today. We will send the recording around and the slides. And uh, have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>